welcome to Science Goes to the Movies. Look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovetz. For the most part here on Science Goes to the Movies, we're reasonably respectful when pop culture misrepresents facts in favor of telling a good dramatic story. But every once in a while, we like to do an episode we call Screaming at the Screen, where we gather experts from a specific profession and invite them to correct some of the cultural misconceptions that arise from these misrepresentations. On this episode, we're going to look at how the stories we see in movies impact our expectations of the facts and realities of lawyers and the law. We're joined by Natalie Chin, a CUNY law professor and co-director of the Disability and Aging Justice Clinic, and Ellen J. Stein, a family law attorney practicing in Los Angeles. Welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great to be here. I'm gonna start with some of the general misconceptions people may have about lawyers based on courtroom dramas. First up, in some movies and most TVs, all good lawyers are very wealthy lawyers. In fictions, lawyers who are not extraordinarily wealthy are also portrayed as kooky and incompetent and also very poorly dressed. Does that, mis does that presentation warp the public's understanding of what a lawyer is? I think it absolutely does. The idea that the wealthy, well-dressed lawyer is the expensive lawyer and that the expensive lawyer is the best and most competent lawyer is clearly not accurate, although I do think it reflects the American view that what something costs is what it's worth. I'm a civil rights lawyer, but um, I'm around a lot of criminal defense attorneys. My wife is a former public defender, and I think you see that presentation often in, in crime dramas or you know, crime shows, and the public defender is just like really ill-prepared, not dressed well, just doesn't present. And there's this idea that then they're not a good lawyer. And, and that's actually quite untrue and a disservice to public defenders and other attorneys who work in the public service. On The Good Fight, which is a very entertaining show and I feel a little bit bad about picking at it, but I'm going to anyway. In Audra McDonald's divorce case, her husband presents evidence that McDonald's character, Liz Lawrence, purchased a morning after pill and therefore she must be having an affair. Ellen, does the state of Illinois care if Liz Lawrence is having an affair? Absolutely not. All 50 jurisdictions in this country are no fault. And not only does the court not care, but you can't bring it in as evidence in most cases. But then Ellen, do you have clients who, based on this extended version of the CSI effect, expect that they are going to have uh, their day in court to air all aspects of their dirty laundry like they see on TV? Absolutely, and I think it's true of litigants in all kinds of cases, not just family law cases, that they want to be heard. They want the judge to hear their story. I think what distinguishes family law is that often people's emotions are very high, and they're looking for that Perry Mason moment. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. They think that there's going to be a moment where the judge is going to look at their spouse, point, and proclaim what a dirty, rotten, cheating liar their spouse is, and it's just not reality. So question for both of you. In TV courtrooms, it feels like justice is always eventually served and that every American gets and deserves their day in court. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! But in reality, what's the relationship between a courtroom and justice? I think, as Ellen said, it's very rare for a case to actually go to trial. And a lot of what happens in litigation happens behind the scenes in settlement. So in terms of a litigant getting their day in court, it can look like so many different things. It can look like, for example, a case where our client was living in a nursing home and she wasn't giving uh, ASL interpreting and she's deaf. So we're not gonna, that's not going to go to trial but we were able to litigate that behind the scenes and get her um, the supports that she needed. So I think it's not as sexy or, or, you know, like TV to see the cases in settlement. Sometimes it can be heated settlement, maybe more in family court, perhaps. I was going to say, <laughs> the settlement conversations can be very exciting. But you don't see that on TV, right? You only see the cross-examinations, which are really hot and heavy a lot of the time. But I think it depends a lot on the client getting their day in court because of the demographics and the socioeconomic class being in federal court is more expensive. So it's sort of this, um, this 
lack of access to federal court if you don't have the, the funds or finances to get into that setting. And federal court is a very different um, kind of litigation, and it can be seen as a bit more highbrow or a bit more, um, you know, a lot of different stereotypes around federal court versus state and lower courts. Well, I think that's a very important issue right there. On TV, you don't see court costs. On TV, mm -hmm. it's all free and just and <laughs> right. But what is, what's the reality of the price of justice? It's that most people cannot afford a lawyer to go to court. I mean, in, mm -hmm. in California, where I practice, more than 50% of the litigants in family law cases are unrepresented. Um, and we see those percentages in, in areas where what's happening in court is really important to the individual. So in family court, it's your access to your children, it's your financial future going forward. In immigration court, obviously, you know, the stakes are huge. Landlord tenant court, the average tenant isn't represented and it can be really case dispositive. The financial piece also affects people's ability to to continue with the case. So sometimes settlement is driven by very practical considerations that really have nothing to do with what we might consider justice. Mm. So for example, um, a, a person who is, is arrested and is in custody until their criminal trial may not be able, may not have the money to bail out. That person may make a calculated decision that they're going to plead to a crime that they don't believe they, or, or they know they didn't commit, just because they don't want to lose their job, they want to get back to their family, they want to get out of jail. That's a great point Owen's making, especially now uh, in this post-George Floyd world that we're living in. I mean, we've always been dealing with issues of bail reform, uh, and you have millions of people who are sitting in jail because, as Ellen mentioned, they can't pay their bail. And there's all this conversation about defund the police, and that sort of starts at the bottom, right? And, and that's a, a, an excellent point around who has access and what choices does one have to make to get justice. We talk a lot these days about the brutal experience Black Americans suffer at the hands of the police. Does that experience continue right on into the courtroom? I would say absolutely. There is a significant power dynamic in play in the courtroom. And primarily people of color um, aren't the ones with the power, especially when you look at criminal court or in housing court. Um, there is this, this imbalance and this lack of respect and acknowledgement of humanity, right? Things that we consider like the right to housing, the right to access to healthcare. You have to fight for these things in, in court. A lot of times it's going to be low income people and low income people of color fighting for this. So, you know, the parallels happening with police brutality and with COVID and who's been disproportionately impacted, people of color, people of color with disabilities, people with disabilities, it really mirrors the justice system and rather the injustice system that we're seeing. So I would say absolutely. I think in many cases it does, but not always. And I'll speak again to, to the, the courthouse in which I practice, which is a state courthouse and it's family law. And our bench more and more is reflecting the population of California. Not entirely, there's still differences, but who's sitting on the bench, I think makes a real difference. And there is a tremendous effort in our court system to educate our judges on bias. And they're very conscious of, of checking their, their decision-making process and, and looking for their own bias so that they, they can um, you know, act against it. Um, at the same time, the judges in the courts are, are carrying out the law and if the law or the you know or the systemic problems are there that's going to get carried through in in the in the decisions that judges make i think it's important definitely to have a diversified bench but i think to ellen's latter point that the system that's in place within the courts within housing court within criminal court you can have the most diversified bench but it doesn't it's not going to get the lit the person before the court very far because the systems of oppression that are in the criminal justice system, that are in the housing court system are still there. So I do certainly think uh, diversity within the bench and anti-bias and anti-oppression training is very different, but it has to be throughout the system. And, and perhaps this is a moment you know, where we are now in society that we can actually hold on to it and, and, and use this momentum to change the system or start changing these systems. In the CBS drama, uh, the Good Fight, which clearly I've watched a lot of. You're seeing in that drama uh, these new judges recently appointed by the current administration, and they're portrayed as incompetent, blustery, know-nothing frat boys. 
holding the lives of plaintiffs and of plaintiffs and defendants in their hands. And are you seeing the impact of any of these new federal judges? I'm so glad you asked about you know the judges that Trump has put you know has um, put forward and who've gone through the system because I think it's hard for the public to. to you know, really comprehend the depth of importance of the of the judicial system and the, and the courts and what judges mean. So all these judges, so Trump has appointed more judges to the federal bench than I think the last four or five judges combined. And these appointments are indefinite, which means it lasts the judge's whole life. And he's appointing younger and younger people and across the, the right wing spectrum. So yes, I haven't been before these judges, but I can tell you that Trump has successfully changed the trajectory of the court for generations to come in that it's a very right-leading conservative um, judicial system that we're going to be dealing with at the federal level and it's going to have ramifications for a very, very long time. What I would also add is that many of these judges being appointed are not only highly partisan and young, but many of them are justices who really don't have the skills and mm -hmm. background that we typically expect of our federal judiciary. Many of these ju judges have been found unsatisfactory by the bar associations. And I think the overall impact is to lessen the public's confidence in the entire judiciary system. And I think that that spills over no matter whether you're in federal court or state court. The 1993 movie Philadelphia was based on the real lives of attorney Jeffrey Bowers and Clarence McCain. And in the movie, Denzel Washington defends Tom Hanks. Am I being fired? Against a wrongful dismissal suit against his law firm, Kate, claiming uh, Hanks' character was fired only because he was gay. And uh, court fines for Hanks' character and awards him $5 million. But why does that giant award to Hanks' character matter beyond that one case and the one plaintiff who, who won it? In other words, what is legal precedence? Well, I think in that, in that case, I mean, I like that movie. I haven't seen it in such a long time. I like the soundtrack <laughs> too. Uh, so legal precedence means in that particular jurisdiction, let's say Philadelphia and the jurisdictions around, um, courts have to follow that case law, depending if it's, it's within um, the same court system per se. So if you have that one case and the judge publishes that opinion and it goes a certain way, it carries weight, not only in that jurisdiction, it can be persuasive outside of that jurisdiction. So we need those cases to build really good case law to establish a right that you can't be fired because of your sexual orientation. It's similar to the marriage equality cases that popped up all over the country. It was a full court press. So every state right, responded differently to marriage equality. But as more cases start building and becoming more successful, we could build up a federal case to make a constitutional claim. So it's kind of like little building blocks, right, to, to change systemic laws in the long run, particularly if it's about fundamental rights. And the point then being that these judges who are pushing the court to the right are building up right-leaning precedent. It's very depressing, but that I, I, yes, that is true. There have been some pretty ugly decisions that have come down. Um, that are really going in that direction. So yes, that's, that, and I think the, it's important for the, somehow the public education around the impact of these decisions on our human lives, because it's hard, it seems like such a disconnect, right? It seems very theoretical when you have a case that comes down because if it doesn't impact you immediately, it's hard to understand why it's so important, why these judgeships matter. And there's an interesting moment I've seen repeated across a variety of fictional dramas in which the judge is faced with a decision that's morally wrong, um, but legally correct. Judges who clearly fear for, say, the plaintiff or in a particular case, but side with the defendant because the body of law presented to them in the courtroom requires them to, which is a great drama. But what is this body of law that can force an all-powerful judge to rule against their own moral morality? No, I think that I've never come across the issue where a judge uh, has to rule against their own conscience or ethics. I'm trying to think about when that situation might come up. I mean, it, it certainly probably comes up in dramas, but I'm thinking like in real life, like what would that really look like? So, you know, I don't know what that would look like for a judge to go against their own conscience because they have to follow the law. Because judges also can um, be creative in their, in their decisions and they can find ways to follow the law and still um, 
go with their conscience. So I think that that's not, it's never going to be that black and white. That's the, one of the beautiful to a double-edged sword things about the law that it isn't black and white. There's always this sort of, you know, colorful in between. I love the way your, your face lit up when you talked about the law. It was, it was actually quite moving and amazing. Um, <laughs> But just for, just as a layperson, let me let me reiterate. So I understand that that a case builds precedence, and the the precedence builds the body of the law, and the body of the law changes over time. That's a whole course. We could have a whole semester on that issue. Um, so Ellen, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So yeah, so body. So let's just look at the Supreme Court. So there've been cases where, for example. Um, same-sex partners were, pro it was, they could get arrested for having sex in their own home. That was the body of law for a long time. And then Lawrence v. Texas happened. And so the Supreme Court overturned its own prior decision. So one thing about, let's talk about federal decisions because that impacts a larger amount of, of people nationally is that sometimes it can change with the mores of society with what direction society is going. And I think that's one reason why our president wants to put in more conservative judges. It's like this conflict that's happening. The world around us is changing in this more diversified way, not just with race, with disability, with sex and gender, but yet putting in more conservative judges is kind of trying to put a halt on um, expanding that reality in voting rights in particular, in disability rights in particular, in reproductive justice, all of these things that are so innate it are changing around us with the way people are feeling and thinking about these issues, putting in partisan younger judges to sort of put like put the stop on that is a reality and it can happen. So yes to your question, it does change. Precedent can change because courts can overrule their prior precedent, but at the same time they can also be rolled back in a sense, like we're seeing with reproductive justice. Here's a TV and movie trope that drives me as a lay person crazy. In the pursuit of justice, it's okay for a lawyer to overstep ethical concerns and snoop around in other people's filing cabinets or have, a, have an affair with a witness. And let's not even <laughs> start with the courtroom drama conniption fits most fictional lawyers indulge in. But in reality, what are the ethical expectations and comportment of a practicing attorney? They're tremendous. First of all, attorneys are licensed. So you can't just graduate law school and go out and practice. So there are societal expectations, there are professional obligations, there are statutory obligations, and we're fiduciaries, which means we have heightened obligations to our clients, which often involve putting their interests above our own. We have duties of confidentiality um, and certainly our behavior. You want to throw a conniption fit in a judge's courtroom, first off, that judge is going to shut you down really quickly. Second, there goes your professional reputation. And if you don't think that every clerk and every judge doesn't talk to every clerk and every other judge in the courthouse, then you're very naive about how, how the real world works. So at the end of the day, what a lawyer has is their reputation and their credibility. So very few lawyers are going to be throwing that away on one client. Um, and there's all kinds of regulation about having sexual relations with a client, doing business with a client, all of the really fun things that you see on, on television are, not, are, are regulated and, and largely wouldn't be happening in, in the real world. That's such a fun question. I mean, I loved, like, I love teaching my students about, there's something called the model rules of professional conduct. Every state also has their own model rules. And it's, it's what, what we call the floor of ethical considerations that every attorney in the entire country has to consider around confidentiality, zealous advocacy, fiduciary duties, conflicts of interest. And so there's actually a body that gives you guidance. And then there's something called the comments within those model rules that really go full throttle as to different details of different situations one could get in as an attorney uh, and things to consider. What's interesting about the model rules of professional conduct is that uh, it's under the discretion in terms of how each attorney inter like, is going to follow it. There's a chance I might have made a mistake. 
with the client list. We do only see family law and criminal law on TV. What is a social justice lawyer? So I think a social justice lawyer, I, we teach this in, in my seminar, my disability and aging justice seminar, and I assigned my students a really great article by a professor, William Quigley. It's called Letter to a Law Student Interested in Social Justice. And a social justice lawyer is so many different things. Uh, it's recognizing that your client is centered first. It's recognizing that you aren't the voice of your client. You're a part of the greater movement for justice for that client and the issues that are systemic to what your client is dealing with. Um, you have to be uncomfortable as a social justice lawyer. Maybe you're not going to uh, make as much money as a social justice lawyer, right? You have to um, sort of recognize that you're going up against a system, not just one issue at a time, but it's an entire system, but you're not in it alone, right? You're working with your client who oftentimes has more information than you. So I really think it's much more centered in that idea that you're lawyering collaboratively as much as possible, which I don't think is much that you see on the movies or in TV. But I do urge students who might want to be interested in law school or who are in law school to look at Quigley's article. If you're interested in social justice lawyering, it's online. You can just Google it. Quigley social justice. Going back to the original idea of, of, of only seeing wealthy lawyers on TV, can, in real life, can a lawyer do well by doing good? I think it depends on how you define doing well. So <laughs> if doing well is how much money you make, there are still ways for lawyers to do well by doing good. So for example, a lawyer who takes on a class action suit which is providing access to people often whose claims are not large enough that they could afford a lawyer or be worth individually hiring a lawyer. But when those claims are aggravated, aggregated can be very significant. If that lawyer hits big on a case, that lawyer can make a significant amount of money. Similarly with uh, personal injury lawyers, many clients can't afford when they're hurt to pay a lawyer by the hour, but a personal injury lawyer will take a case on contingency. And if that case comes up with a big verdict, that lawyer can become very wealthy. Um, but you know, again, you know, back to what Natalie was saying and, and sort of my motivations for going into law, there are many non-monetary satisfactions that many of us get in the practice. You know, helping keep a child safe, or um, helping your client provide for their financial future. Having a client call you 10 years after you've represented them and say, you know, you told me what was gonna happen. It's been difficult, but it's what I wanted and I think about you from time to time. Um, those sorts of things don't have a price. So I think, yes, depends how you define well. I think there's some things we can really think hard about as to how we can ensure that there are more social justice public service attorneys, because it is true, you're going to be making a legal services salary for a while unless you're at that organization a long time and it plateaus and you can be comfortable. But some things that can be done is loan forgiveness for law schools, for those students who wanna be social justice lawyers, for legal aid organizations to have wages for incoming lawyers that is actually more than livable, right? Because you, the students are gonna have student loans. So I do think there's ways that we can not, try not to lose awesome law students who really do wanna go into public service but can't because they really can't afford it. I mean, that's just the reality. There are certain sacrifices, but to Ellen's point, they are very rewarding. But the reality is that it, it can be very financially challenging to go into social justice lawyering. Although we do see, and, and it's, it, it's you know, clearly a much smaller part of the social justice work being done, but many of the large, affluent, prestigious law firms do believe it's part of their mission. And, and certainly in California, it's part of our, it's suggested in our rules of, of professional conduct that we provide a certain amount of pro bono service. So do you guys have a thing about pop culture or, or movies or stories about lawyers, it just makes you crazy, not the way yeah. it happens? Yes. I think the representation of prosecutors is way overblown. And, <laughs> and they, in their representation, like they are the justice seekers and they are the ones that are gonna fight for the truth. And as we know, that is, there certainly are prosecutors that are down that road, but systemically and looking at the system of prosecution, that is the way it plays out on TV is not the way it plays out in real life. That is one of my biggest 
uh, frustrations with, with these TV drama, these criminal dramas, and also the lack of uh, representation in terms of the diversity of the stuff we see on TV around who is seeking justice and for what. But there's not enough visibility with people with disabilities on TV. We don't see it. And if we do see it, it's very white. It's about autism, specifically to white men, things like that. So the diversity of disability, people of color, as litigants, uh, I'd love to see more of that. Hey, look, we share a lot of things, but we do not share histories. I think what most makes me crazy is the representation of a lawyer as a hired gun. Um, and, and that lawyers only do what they're doing for the money. Um, you know, as we've talked about, we have ethical responsibilities, but lawyers, you know, many of us are very proud of the work we do and our ability to, to help people through different moments of their lives. And, and so that, that's insulting. And it also is just not consistent with what I see in, in my colleagues. One thing that frustrates me is that you don't really hear the voice of the client themselves. And a lot of lawyering should be client-centered around social justice, but then you're not really seeing social justice lawyering on TV. You're seeing the, the glitz and the glamour and these high-profile lawyers. And so it's such a misrepresentation of how this, you know, justice and law aren't necessarily the same things. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We could talk about this for a very long time and, and we'll have to have you back sometime to get into more details, but right now we're out of time. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs>